I'm Susan Dixon. I'm the Vice President of Programs at the Chinese Historical Society of Co Southern California. I really would like to welcome everyone. First, welcome our, our, our membership. But then this, this time we are also being, uh, our community sponsor is China Society. I welcome them. And then I saw that there are a lot of names that I don't recognize and we welcome you all. And so I wanted to start a little bit by giving a, a brief history of the Historical Society. Started in 1976 and we, our mission statement, we really are trying to um, research uh, the history of the Chinese in America. We're trying to record that and make it known that history and make it known and honor those who came before. So part of that, um, after the research making it known, we have, uh, we have written books. Um, we have a yearly Gumsan journal, which is really, we pick a theme and we do interviews and, um, and then we've been doing that since 1976. We, we also, um, G, our president, Jean Moy, um, gives wonderful walking tours of, of New Chinatown. We, um, one of the, our big successes is that 11 years ago, we decided that we wanted to make the history of Chinese accomplishments in uh, the development of Yosemite. So we have for 10 years been having a pilgrimage uh, to Yosemite. And now you should check it out. There is an exhibit in a former laundry building in Wawona. And let's see, I'm trying, I'm forgetting some things. Oh yeah, part of the big challenge with the new things is to make things accessible to everyone. And we're doing that through uh, a good internet presence. Part of it is we are a research uh, institution with a, um, a wide library. And so you could get the titles for that either on our, of what we do have on our website or through Libib. We are into making, um, we're into make a Gumsan Journal website. We have, to, um, we have finding aids for what we've done. We have online exhibits. But then we continue to have monthly meetings like what we have tonight. So starting in 1976, during the school year, we had first Wednesday of every month, we have had a monthly meeting. Now we've been able to expand our reach because with Zoom, we can attract so many more people and so many fabulous uh, speakers like our speaker tonight. I met David Lay in New York. Little did I know when I was chatting at him um, at an opening of an exhibit in MOCA that he was the VIP. And the more I found out about him later, uh, he is a community historian with a wide variety of interest. And so he provided us with his bio. He focused pretty much on his interest uh, and connections to um, China, a Chinese lion dancing in um, in America. So David, uh, he co-founded the Qingna uh, dance troupe in 1966. Three years later, he became a lion dancer. And um, since then he has, uh, he has become a, um, San Francisco Chinese New Year um, parade festival director. And if you've ever been to the Chinese New Year parade in San Francisco, it's quite extensive. So that is quite uh, um, an honor that, that we would have him. So I'm going to um, tell you to put things in the chat, uh, Q&A to Jean Moy, because we, after the presentation, we hope to have a lively conversation and pick his brain. Just tonight, think if you like what you do, we that uh, you might consider becoming a member. But on that note, I'll give my time to David. 
Thank you, Susan. Uh, um, I noticed on the participants, we have now 117. I think by 759, I'm going to lose half of you because you'll be checking the Powerball number, see if you want the 1.2 billion. But uh, why don't we have everybody pledged now that have purchased this ticket to pledge 10 million to the Chinese Historical Society of Southern California if you win. So if you pledge that, go to reaction and click the raise hand bar. So we know you've made a pledge and we'll look to see if you won. So good luck to everybody to start. Now, earlier this year, I made this presentation and can I have Rick put on the first slide? so we can get that going. So earlier this year, I made this lecture to the Chandong Village Project in China to a mainly Chinese audience, contrasting how Chinese in America interpret Chinese culture. I wish to first thank CHSSC uh, board members, Linda Bentz and Susan Dixon, who invited me for this talk. Now, I have been involved with line dancing since 1969 with the Zhongai Dance Troupe in San Francisco, which I co-founded this traditional Chinese folk dance troupe when I was still in high school, and that was in 1966. My friends all thought this was strange. Why would I start a Chinese dance troupe? Well, I figured that is where the girls are, and I was right. I met and married one of the dancers and have been ma uh, happily married for the last 49 years. My lion dance Sifu was Felix Yi, Yu Fu. So this is very traditional Chinese. You have to acknowledge your teachers uh, and your Sifu. And that is me in this picture, lion dancing in 1971. It is quite difficult to dance well after the age of 30. You think you can still dance, but the audience knows better. So I retire at the age of 30 and then concentrated on researching Chinese performing arts and Chinese culture, including the lion dance. For me, culture is the artistic expression of a defined group of people. Our shared common history, experiences, and oftentimes values. Cultural heritage implies a bond, our belonging to a community. It represents our history, our identity, our bond to the past, to the present, and to the future. Lion dancing embraces all of these. Next slide, please. In 1994, I co-founded the Chinese Performing Arts Foundation, Zhonghua Yan Yi Xie Hui. My research Sifu teacher, William Sihu, shown on the bottom right, and the foundation funded Dr. Hu to research Chinese line dance. In 1995, we published this 400-page book in English. This book we sold at $40. It is now $5,000 on Amazon, the last time I checked a few months ago. So there's great interest in line dancing in America. The foundation currently has 13 more unpublished chapters on line dancing not included in this book. We plan to put these chapters free on the internet in a year or two. So if you wish to see some of the chapters in advance and share knowledge of line dancing with us, my email will be posted at the end of the talk. Next slide, please. There are other people doing uh, research on line dancing, a few in English and many more in Chinese. One that's doing it in English is Corey Chan in San Francisco who researched the construction of lions and dragons, how to make them. Corey's team restored this 1890 dragon named Mulong in Marysville, which is two hours by car northeast of San Francisco. On the picture on the left is before restoration, on the right is after res restoration. It took them half a year to do this in 2014. 
Mu is now display at the Balkai Temple in Marysville. The current temple was built in 1880 and is still an active temple. On March 5th, uh, on March 5th this year, they celebrated the 142nd anniversary of the Balkai Festival and Parade. This is the longest continuous festival parade in California. Mu is one of the oldest performance dragon in the world, if not the oldest, purchased in 1890 and even performed in the Chicago Columbian World's Fair in 1883 and later in 1911 in, the New, in New York for their 4th of July parade. If you think about it, the logistic to move 100 performers, about 100 performers from Marysville to Chicago in 1883, and then later to New York, the logistics must be monumental during this period of segregation. These performers would not be able to check into most hotels nor eat at restaurants along the way. But to show off Chinese culture and heritage to, the, to Americans was important enough for the early Chinese in America that they expended the resources and endured the hardship to do this, to message that Chinese were more than just common laborers. This also happened with the Chinese in Australia. Mu Long's brothers and contenders to be the oldest performing performance dragons are in Australia. One is in the Bendigo Golden Dragon Museum, another dragon in the Ballarat Gold Museum, and one more at the Stay Yup Guandai Mu in Melbourne. It was to show that the Chinese were organized and had a glorious history, and the Chinese were very proud of this, and they want to let the world know that they are organized and they have cultural things like this dragon. Mu Long is the second dragon imported into California. The first was a dragon imported three years earlier than Mu in 1887. It was uh, imported by the Hao Wang uh, Temple. And Hao Wang is the patron deity of the Yongwo Association, which is the most numerous in terms of the number of Chinese and the wealthiest association in the first decade of the gold rush. Yongwo is the association for the people from Hyeongsan, today known as Dongsan. And the Yongwo, they have on register 14,000 members in San Francisco, in California at the end of 1850. And this is more members than any other district association, more than the people from Toysan, which came later in the 1860s as laborers. So I'm trying to figure out within these Zongsan people, uh, because or Heonsan people that we have in Hawaii. Hawaii is known for people from Yongwo, but most of them are Hakka. So I wonder how many of these people from Zongsan at that time, the first decade, were Hakka, because in my mind, the Hakka's knew mining. Uh, they were the miners in Southeast Asia. They were mining for gold and tin 100, 200 years before gold was discovered. If I were a farmer in Toysan, I probably wouldn't spend a whole year's wage to buy that ticket to come to America. But if I were a Hakka and I knew mining, I would definitely take that risk. So this is something we have to research more. Next slide, please. Corey Chan also does research on line dancing. He has this 53 page booklet on the left on the Big Hep Buddha's role in line dancing and has been collecting and documenting various type of Chan Chan or chants are puzzle or mazes to challenge the lion to get the greens or to get the red envelope. So to the right, uh, this is at the end of getting Chang's high up on a building. These chants are challenge. Uh, these chants challenge the skills and knowledge of the lion dancers. It took physical strength, 
and teamwork to get through the obstacles of the Chang and knowledge of Chinese history and culture to figure out the meaning of the puzzle and how to attack this chain. The reward for performing correctly is the red envelope or hong bao or lai si incorporated into the chain. So you go from place to place in a community to get these chants, and we call this choi chan. So do remember this term, choi chan. There will be a test later on. When I was performing the uh, performing line dancing, it and if my team could not figure out the meaning of the chan, we would reluctantly skip that chan and let another line dance team with more knowledge to get the red envelope. So you have to have this history uh, before you can really perform line dance. Next slide. Here are pictures of 4chan. On the bottom left, we have a snake. Uh, on the upper right, we have a symbolic centipede. Each chan has its own hidden meaning to be performed for a specific occasion. The one on the bottom right, I set up for a wedding of a friend. The hidden meaning is together, uh, is together to all with the rebus, tong xie dao lao. So if you look at this bottom right, tong has the same sounds as browns. So it's, it's a heater made out of browns. So we borrow the word tong. And then we have a pair of shoes, which is xie and mandarin. Uh, uh, and it's an old pair of wooden shoes. So that gives us the word o. So it's tong xie dao lao. So combine it means together until o. And shoes also convey that because shoes are always together until they're worn and they're old. So they're not separated. So you would do these special chain for special occasions. Corey has documented more than 800 of these chains. And I'm encouraging Corey to publish and make this 40 years of research public. All this research is to show line dancing is much more than entertainment. We have 3,500 years of Chinese history and culture are incorporated into line dancing. Next slide. When you ask people in America, why is the lion dance performed? The answer is always to ward off evil spirits. However, if you ask the lion dancers themselves, what are these evil spirits? Can you describe them to me? Do you actually believe in these evil spirits? And how does this dance actually scare them away? The answer is always no, or I don't know. So why do we say this? Why do we always tell people line dancing is to ward off evil spirits? So why is this line dance performed? Next slide. Let's first look at the history. Lions are not indigenous to China. They're not found there. The first recorded tribute of a lion was at 87 CE or 87 AD during the reign of Zhang Di on the right, Emperor Zhang, uh, Zhang Di, Han Emperor. From, and the gift of the lion was from Hyrcania, which is ancient Persia. However, the Chinese knew about lions even before the Han Dynasty, but they called the lion Suanni as the word in this Ming Dynasty uh, woodblock print on the left. So the, before the Chinese call it a Sizu, we call it a Suanni. Next slide. So the first line came in 87 AD and that's recorded. And it was followed two years later in 89 CE with two gifts of lion, one from Parthia, which is Northeast Iran, and the other from the Kushan Empire or from the Yuezi in Gandhara, Pakistan, and Eastern Afghanistan. I will take a little time to talk about Gandhara. This, this is where we get all these Buddhist statuary. 
uh, from Gandhara. And these were brought to China along with Buddhism during the uh, Eastern Han Dynasty about 100 to 200 AD. And these, uh, and who lived in Gandhara? They were Kushans. So who are the Kushans? The Kushans actually lived in central China uh, until the first emperor, uh, Chen, Qin Shi Huang, kicked them out, pushed them out. So they kept moving west until they settled in the area of Afghanistan and Pakistan. And, but they learned these carving from, from when Alexander the Great was in India and brought along with him artisan to do this Greek and Roman style of statuary. So the Kushans originally from China carved these Buddhist statue and reintroduced them back to China where the Chinese took off from copying these statues and made it their own. So uh, the world was very small and we ended with all these uh, uh, changes of uh, exchanging of culture. And it was at this time that the China uh, conquered the Silk Road and took control of the Silk Road. And this, this is the reason why lions were brought to China as tribute. Next slide, please. So by the Han Dynasty, the Chinese knew what lions looked like. So the statues look pretty much like real lions. And here by the Tang Dynasty, we've, uh, this was discovered about 20, 25 years ago. And if you look at it, it's obvious that by Tang Dynasty, they had lion dancers. Now, this is during the Tang Dynasty, which we Cantonese call Tong Chu. So we call ourselves Tong Yan and Tong Yan Gai, uh, people of Tang and the uh, street of the Tang people, or Tong Yan Fao, the port of the Tang people. Because for us Cantonese, the Tang Dynasty was when the South was really settled and incorporated into central China. And it was a very, this was the Renaissance period of China. It was uh, the emperors were the Li, my, my clan, uh, the Li's from Donghang or Onghang uh, in Toisan were the emperors. We came from Gansu way up north in uh, Longsai, this area in Gansu. So we really came from the north and came all the way to Guangdong when the Mongols invaded. So the Tang Dynasty, the Tang poetry sounds better in Cantonese because our Tonghua is the language of that period. Next slide, please. So here is the pair of lions in the Forbidden City. The female or the mother lion is stepping on the baby here towards us. Uh, and the lion on the right, uh, up on the right of this picture is a male lion and has his paws on a embroidered ball. The male lion is what we say is stage left. So if you're looking at the stage looking out is on your left hand side. So the male lion is stage left and the female is stage right. For the Chinese, the placement of the lines are important for good feng shui. Always remember nam zhao nui yao. You may wonder why is the mother line stepping on the baby line. Next slide, please. Notice the claws of the mother line are in the mouth of the baby line. You can see it in the bottom right, definitely, in that granite statue. The claw of the mother line is in the mouth of the baby cub. Lions were not found in China, and the Chinese thought lions gave milk through its claws. So the mother is suckling the cub and not stepping on the cub. Today, maybe one in a million Chinese knows this. So welcome to this very exclusive club, one in a million. So when we, 
when we share such unique knowledge, it makes us a special group, a unique community. Next time you walk by a lion that's stepping on a little lion, you will smile because you know something special, something other people don't know, hidden meaning of Chinese culture. Next slide. It was an obligation in traditional China to have sons. It was an obligation, less a desire, but an obligation. To be filial, you must continue the line. So the desire to have sons is great. The sculptor here wishes to visually make sure you understand this. When you look at a Chinese object, you need to look carefully and read all the messaging, messaging intended by the maker. One must also have knowledge of Chinese history, culture, and symbolism to hear these layers of messaging. Next slide. Now, going back to the placement of lines, why is that important? The proper placement of lines, I told you, is male stage left and female stage right, because together, if you have female, a girl, and then a boy to the, uh, seeing this on the picture, if you place them properly, that would be opposite from the stage. Uh, when you put it together, you form the word how, or good, as seen on the left, female and male. Placed properly, you have good, you have goodness. And if you place them wrong, you're, you don't have goodness. And this is why it's important. Next slide. Now we have a problem in San Francisco where the placement of the lion at the gateway into Chinatown are placed wrong. If you look at this, uh, the females towards us, so it stays left where the male should be. And the male is then on the other side. Worse is that no one noticed. We have forgotten and lost part of our culture and our heritage. When we do not share common knowledge and agree on the rules of engagement, then we no longer have things in common and are no longer a community or a defined group. Next slide. The, can the Cantonese lions originated from Cantonese opera troops in Fosan and Hesan. And Hesan. Uh, these are districts in Guangdong, Fatsan and Hosan. They are relatively recent invention. Lions were made up in the mid 19th century, about the same time gold was discovered in California and Australia. The opera costume makers copied the Hunan lions, but added Cantonese opera face painting, pom-poms and attachments meaningful to Cantonese opera. There's a large bump. If you see the line on the right, there's a mirror. Underneath the mirror is a large bump on the forehead of the lion called a qimu. Qimu, uh, actually qimu. The qimu allows lines to transport itself anywhere. This is the same for the bump on the forehead of the dragon. That's why it's incorporated there. You look at all the Cantonese lions and dragons, they always have that bump. And this allows them to transport themselves to fly. A reflector is always kept there. And this reflector is supposed to be uh, to gather auspicious chi from ten or from heaven and then rebroadcast it out to the community. And the Chinese Canton or the Cantonese lion always have painted face like in the opera. Each color would have its own meaning. It will have a long white beard, meaning old age, or a black beard, meaning younger uh, lion. The nose, which you can't see too clearly, is always in the shape of a ruyi fungus, which means everything turns out as you wish. It has a large open mouth with large fangs, teeth, and a prominent tongue. The tongue is pronounced lei in Cantonese, a homonym for prophet. It makes no sense, sense in Mandarin 
they call it a sertou, but in Cantonese is lei. So whenever you see a tongue, a animal with a tongue sticking out, it means profit. So when a lion goes into a store to perform, it is required to lick the cash register to wish the store plenty of lei or plenty of profit. A horn on top of the head and a pair of antennae topped with two pom-pom. You can see them parallel with the eyes, the two pom-poms. Why the horn and antennae and pom-poms? By the mid 19th century, Chinese knew what real lions looked like. They had plenty of them in their zoos. However, art is able to transport us to another realm, to another dimension free from the constraints of reality. This tradition of freeing the mind from the constraints of reality can be seen as early as 3,000 years ago in China on the, on the Chinese bronzes. They're filled with fantastic animal. As early as the Shang Dynasty, the Chinese artists were free from the restraint of reality to convey another message to connect with the other dimension, to connect with deities, to connect with ancestors. The Shang Dynasty, the Shang Dynasty bronzes were used ritualistically to transport food to ancestors to where they live in another realm. And for this purpose, the art on these vessels, on these trays, in these wine containers are free from the reality of this world. Next slide, please. The same can be said for performance arts. Chinese historians believe all Chinese drama and dance have their origin in shamanism. And so we see a shaman here on the right. I believe the two antennae with pom-poms represent two more eyes for the a uh, four-eyed Chinese shaman known as the Fang Shang Shi, as, with the, as also with the horn on the shaman, as well as the prominent fangs and teeth. So if you look at this shaman, this Chinese shaman has the four eyes, the horns, the fangs, the teeth, and a wide open mouth. So if we look at the lower left, the origin of the open mouth uh, goes back to Chinese no, uh, the no wu, the mass exorcist dances. As to the wide open mouth, the famous Cernucci uh, Museum in Paris has this tiger brown yo, which is a wine container showing a tiger with a wide open mouth and a man sticking his head into the mouth without fear. Such bronzes as this were used for ancestral veneration. It was believed by ancient Chinese that animals can help shamans communicate with the other world, with ancestors. And one can enter the realm of ancestor through the mouths of animals. Next slide, please. Cantonese opera in which Cantonese line dancing originated was originally performed outdoors in front of village temples to entertain the deities, not to entertain us, the people. The audience just happens to be present and is incidental to why opera troops were higher. The purpose of opera troops is to exercise a community of bad chi or bad air and bring auspiciousness through ritual performances and storytelling. With a bare stage and no backdrop, like on the left and in the village scene in the right. Uh, but through the magic of imagination, the operas took you to another world, another dimension. One moment you are in the imperial court with the emperor, and then the next you're flying with immortals. Even to this day, the majority of opera performances in Hong Kong at the out are at the outlying rural areas performed for ritualistic purposes for temple fairs. Last week I visited Kanwa Chung's store in John Day, which is in eastern Oregon. 
there's a shrine in the store and pasted on the back of the shrine is a written pledge by a devotee that he will supply an opera troupe next year to entertain the deity if his wishes come true this year. So people would hire troops to honor a pledge if their wish came true. So much of the performances of Cantonese opera were impromptu. So a troupe can have a new play every day. This only happens with Cantonese opera. It is very much impromptu. And Cantonese opera was the mass media before radio, before TV, or the daily newspaper. And besides entertainment, the operas taught Chinese history, Confucian morals, ethics, loyalty, benevolence, and justice. It brought news and gossips from home. The modern Cantonese written language came about because uh, came about in the early 20s because of the need to write songs and scripts and playbills for the operas. And of course, the Cantonese lion came to California with these opera troops. So the lion dance in Cantonese opera performances, so the lion dance is really Cantonese opera's opera performance without the songs and the words. It is pantomime, often impromptu, and serves the same purpose of storytelling and ritualistic ex exorcism. Next slide, please. Next slide. Oops, have we lost it? Well, I'll continue. In the early 20th century, Cantonese opera moved from indoors and became out uh, and became moved indoors and became entertainment in large cities as seen in these two pictures. Instead of relying on the audience's imagination, it introduced realistic painted backdrops, glitzy costumes, special effects, and superstar performers, losing much of its shamanistic ritualistic origin. It became entertainment. The same has happened to Chinese line dancing since the 1980s, shifting from a ceremonial dance to entertainment. Next slide. In the 19th and early 20th centuries, line and dragon dancing in America was political. When the dragon is performed beside the flaming pearl, which was used to lead the dragon, which we know about, the dragon must also be accompanied by a rooster lantern, a cart lantern, a flower basket lantern, and the sun and moon lantern as seen here, the sun and moon, the word for sun and moon are here. Remember I said the placement must be male stage left and female stage right to have goodness. So looking at these lanterns on the right, they are uh, placed properly with the sun being yang or male, the stage left, which is which you see on the right hand side here. And the moon being yin female is stage right. However, if you look carefully at the lantern carriers, on this picture on the bottom right, they have their backs to us. So the placement of these lanterns are backward. Is this a mistake? Does anyone notice? In the late 19th and early 20th century, they would definitely notice that this is not right. However, when intentionally reversed, the sun and moon together formed the word Ming, the Chinese word Ming, which can mean bright, but in this case, to mean the Ming dynasty. So when you line dance to Choi Chan, remember I told you to remember this word, Choi Chan. Choi Chan in Mandarin is Cai Qing, which is the same, a homonym in Mandarin to mean step on the Qing dynasty. And the dragon dance with the lantern purposely reverse forming the word Ming, the messaging then becomes clear. It is a call to step on the Qing government and restore the Ming dynasty. Cai Qing Fu Ming, the words written on the bottom. Next slide, please. For the Chinese, the lion is also a teacher because the word for lion, si, and the word for teacher is also si, like 
呃，狮子 for lion and 老师 for teacher， 呃，楼梯 for teacher， 梯级 for 呃、uh, lion， both pronounce C。So for the Chinese， the lion is a teacher。Uh, so the dance, the lion dance teaches. The dance teaches the wisdom of our ancestor. The dance of Choi Chen, getting the green, tells the story of goal setting, training, discipline, bravery, hard work, hard work, defer gratification, to value education and to value tradition, reciprocity, obligation, filial piety, harmony, and the power of teamwork and diversity. I believe it is these values taught by the line dance and the wisdom of our ancestors passed to us that China is the oldest living culture in the world. These values help the Chinese survive and achieve, especially the diasporic Chinese, often living under harsh, racist, and violent circumstances. If these values passed to us by our ancestors have helped us survive and achieve, how do we pass these same values to our descendants? So the next time someone asks you why the Chinese perform the line dance, how will you answer? Will you say once again, line dancing is to ward off evil spirits? I think that will be microaggression, which is for another lecture. Next slide, please. For us diasporic Chinese, we need to fat, first ask ourselves, who will be our descendants? With nearly 30% interracial marriages amongst the Chinese in America, my descendants won't look like me. They most likely won't speak Chinese. So we will need to pass these values to them as mainstream Americans and in the mainstream mainstream and in the American context, meaning that we must say, uh, meaning what we say must be and understandable and meaningful in the American context. Next slide. In closing, uh, for me, these shamanistic rituals of the line dance is important. A recent friend, Marcy Kwan, a art historian at Stanford University reintroduced me to the word enchantment. And I'll read it with you. To be enchanted is to enter a state that defies rational thought. It sometimes is associated with sorcery, the occult. It is to plunge into a world beyond everyday life, beyond the material world. It is magical, delightful, and under a spell. And it is for enchantment that I dance. And I'll leave you with this final thought from T.S. Eliot, uh, his poem, at the still of the turning world, at the still point of the turning world, the, da uh, the dance, there to dance is, sorry. Next slide. I want to thank you all for coming in. And uh, my email is, on the bottom here. And for those that don't read Chinese or don't understand what, why I have two crabs, it's xie xie. The Mandarin word for a crab is pang xie. So this is xie xie to thank you all. So uh, questions, I'll <clears throat> turn this over to Eugene. Thank you, David. And wow, <laughs> I, I, I my, my hat's off to you. I'm, I am still a student and you are my Sifu, so I, I really appreciate your sharing your knowledge uh, with, with all of us. Uh, I'm actually don't see any questions yet, so I, I would encourage everyone to uh, write your questions into the chat. Uh, but in the meantime, I just wanted to make a couple of comments to uh, maybe uh, share a little bit about your experiences uh, running the Chinese New Year parade in San Francisco. I know that uh, I and many of the folks here in this audience have seen the Golden Dragon Parade in LA Chinatown, but we always thought of San Francisco as being the, the big brother of uh, parades. Uh, maybe uh, okay. 
until I see some more questions, uh, maybe perhaps okay. you could share a little bit about how that uh, sure. evolved. I'll talk about the little new uh, about the Lunar New Year. How I got involved. The Lunar New Year parade is made up is like uh, chop suey fortune cookie is a American thing made up here in America. China never had a tradition of a Chinese New Year's parade. The closest thing we have is the Lantern Festival on the 15th day of the new year, where kids would come out at night with their lanterns and form processions. So it was uh, started by H.K. Wong, one of the founder of the Chinese Historical Society of America in 1953 to promote Chinatown, to bring in more tourists. So it's made up, it was a marketing scheme. I got involved in 1965 when I was asked to organize a, a group of uh, my classmates to form the body of the dragon because uh, the martial arts teams in those days were small groups of people with 15, 20 members. So they can handle the head and tail, but they didn't have enough uh, people to handle the bodies. So I got my friends to do the body and we got paid $7. Uh, knowing that at that time, minimum wage was $1.10. So that was a good gig. So all my friends thanked me. Then very soon we found out uh, in the parade, we didn't even have to carry the dragon. The tourists love to be in the dragon. So like uh, Huckleberry, uh, Tom Sawyer, we got the uh, audience to come and carry it for us. And when they got tired, then we carry it. And uh, so we took turn doing it that way. But when I started the dance group, we ended up with having all the costumes and the lion and the we knew how to put together dragons. So pretty soon I was asked to do more and more in the parade and I became the parade director in 1977. And for me, this was important. This was the, you know, that, that was a time in the early 70s was a time where there were a lot of gangs uh, what we hear about the Chinese were often terrible of the gang wars or illegal political contribution, usually pretty bad things. But this was the only time of the year where we controlled the media. They came down and we had about 8 million people watching the parade on TV and it was messaging for us, a chance for us to have the soapbox and remind everybody is Lunar New Year time. So teachers all around the country will say, oh, it's that time of the year. Let's take out the curriculum and talk about the Chinese and the railroad and so on and so forth. So it was uh, a chance for the community to message of Chinese culture, a celebration, something very different. And that's why it's important. I'll throw it back to you, Eugene. Any okay. more questions? Okay, yeah, there is a question from Sarah, and that is, is there any significance to the length of a lion? And actually, I'll extend that question to a dragon. Uh, oh, yes, many... uh, lions are really lion's legs. They Now they have furs, uh, the pants they wear have fur, so they look like lion's leg. So the difference, you know, uh, Westerners often mix them up and say the lion's is dragon uh, oftentimes, but a lion has two, uh, only a pair of legs. So four legs, that's a lion. A dragon, uh, mainly four legs, it can have more, but basically four. And the dragon is the most powerful animal in the Chinese zodiac, is the only mythological animal, and is comprised of the best parts of all the animals. So it has the eyes of a rabbit, the ears of a cow, the mouth of a camel, the body of a serpent, the talons of eagle, and the leg of a tiger, scales of a, uh, of a fish, and a whisker of a carp. So what is the messaging then of the dragon? It is the most powerful animal. So we say that is the emperor. But in reality, what is it telling us today? What is applicable to us today is the power of diversity, which is what America should be and is about. So if you borrow the best from all the culture, you become the most powerful. And the Chinese knew this, and that's really the meaning of the dragon. In the 1920s, about 1925, 
when the uh, Great China Theater opened, today is known as the Great Star Theater. It's the only theater we have going uh, open now in China. That was open in 1925. We have a picture of the opera and on stage are people stack on top of each other, carrying each other to form a dragon. They had a paper mache head and tail, but the dragon body is comprised of people. So the messaging is China now should be a republic. Power is no longer with the emperor, is with the people because the people comprise of the dragon. So it's messaging. And this is very important and the Chinese knew this way back, definitely by the Zhou and Han dynasty. Next great. question. Yeah, yeah. okay, great. Uh, couple of questions, uh, rapid fire here, but, uh, and by the way, everyone in the audience, you know, I, I see many, many friends, friends and hopefully many new friends uh, that we will get acquainted in the future, but we, we do have programs like this uh, every month, first Wednesday of every month, and then except for December, we're going to have actually a dinner at the Golden Dragon restaurant in LA Chinatown. So if you're in the neighborhood, uh, or uh, if convenient for you, uh, we'd like to welcome you. We're going to be working out the details uh, as to how much and the exact time we start. Uh, but look on our website, chssc.org, for further details. We'll be working those out pretty soon. Uh, just real quickly now, uh, here's a, a question. Uh, there are many uh, multicolored lions in some troops. Uh, what's the significance of red, brown, uh, red, black, or white, uh, or other colors? It started off to be only five main color representing, uh, well, initially uh, four, four uh, the four people, uh, the four generals that are in the uh, Longgong Association, Lao Guan Jiu, from the. Uh, novel romance of the three kingdom then they added one more so each color represent one of those generals or uh lao uh, lao bui was the head of the group he was the leader the descendant of the han emperor so it started off to be that but now they have all different colors because it's turned to entertainment less messaging so we see purple and we see all these strange co color combination that's no longer part of the Cantonese opera. Next. Okay. Well, there's a lot of history behind some of this, and I really appreciated your sharing some of the, the background. I really learned about the origins from the Middle East. Here back in the West, though, uh, we know that uh, there was uh, a, 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 a lion, or no, actually, a dragon that was uh, performed in Rock Springs, Wyoming, in the late 1800s. Would you know anything about that? Yes, yeah, so that was 1904. They bought it from the Midwinter Fair in San Francisco in 1904. It was a wealthy merchant in uh, not Rock Spring, nearby was the town Sweetwater. Uh, he bought it there. Uh, it was after the Rock Spring Massacre uh, in 1884, I believe, where about 34 Chinese were massacred. And the sad part was when these Chinese were driven out, they went to, I think, Sweet Water, which is about an hour away. And But the coal mine that hired them in Rock Spring was so important to the railroad that the railroad got the U.S. military to go to Sweetwater and brought the Chinese back to Rock Spring a week later to make them work at the mines because you can't run a railroad without coal. So the Chinese uh, there were under uh, military protection, but they went back and worked. But it was to show off that the Chinese were more than common laborers. They were very proud of their history. 
and that they could do this, that they were so organized, they can expend this kind of money in organization to perform a dragon. You can't do it by yourself. You can't do it with 10 people. You need a lot of people, a lot of organization to do this. So that was the messaging. Now that dragon was destroyed or burned because of the revolution where when China want to modernize, and most of the leaders of the revolution, like Sun Yat-sen, were Christians. And they felt this uh, these belief in dragons and these ceremonies kept the Chinese back. So they purposely destroyed this dragon in 1914, I believe. And what we have left are just the eyes. Someone kept the eyes and they're in the museum at Sweetwater today. That's the other dragon that we have. So we have histories of some of these dragons and they brought uh, the Chinese in those days spent a lot of money to do this. Yeah, and I think the comment back from uh, Ricky uh, Leo was uh, that it might have been in Evanston. Uh, which Evanston, a, you're right. That's, yeah. that's that Sweetwater. Out of Sweetwater, Sweetwater is where the museum is today, I think. Evanston, correct. Right. Thank right. you. Ricky happens to be from Rock Springs, so okay. he's our uh, our board member here. Uh, I get you know we have a lot of information about this dragon. I know where it's made. I have the name of the factory and all that. I'm so. amazed that you have that information. That's uh, well, you no. Know, we also know that we understand that uh, the uh, dragon. I know we're switching from lions to dragons here, but uh, the dragon that was used in L.A. for the La Fiesta was borrowed from Marysville? Absolutely, yes. Later on, it had its own. But in the earlier years, it borrowed from uh, Marysville. Same with the Seattle. There was a Alaska Yukon Festival uh, in the early 1900, and they borrowed a dragon. Even San Francisco borrowed a dragon. So it went all over. New York, it, it, went, it was there July 4th, 1911. But transportation was so difficult for the Chinese, they didn't get back to Marysville until November 10th, something like that. So this was a great undertaking, but it was important for the Chinese to show this. Uh, and, you know, a lot of money was spent and they, would, they did this over and over again. I have a question from Chuck. Any significance to the music that is played or the drum beats? Okay, yes, for the uh, line dancing, the drumming was a language in itself. There's a seven star beat. The seven star refer, refer to the dipper. It refers to where the J Emperor lives. So this is a call to the J Emperor to come down. Then the Sam Singu, the three star beat, is the abode of the three star, Foklok Sao, to invite them to come down. So you like firecracker, not to ward off evil spirits, but you always like firecracker at the beginning of a ceremony and you like incense to welcome the ancestors and the deities to announce to them, we're having a ceremony here. We're having an event here and we're going to have food for you. We're going to have incense for you to call them to come down. And the firecrackers has to be the red paper type and not the cheap newsprint type. So you have the floor all covered in red. The Chinese call that Moon Day Hong. And red is not so much a, a happy color. It is auspicious because red means blood sacrifice. You always have a blood sacrifice for the ancestor, a pig, an ox, a rooster, so there's the, this tradition goes back to Neolithic time and they did it symbolically with cinnabar, the color red. So you want to have the whole floor red, Moon Day Hong, with these red uh, firecrackers. And that welcomes them. It's like red carpet to welcome them and the blood sacrifice. 
And then you have all the smoke and mist. If you see paintings, Chinese paintings of the deities, they're always a misty area. So it sets up the atmosphere to welcome them. And that's the real reason for the firecrackers is that invitations, a call for the deities and for your ancestors to come to your ceremony. Next. That's a, that's a new term for me. The, the floor <laughs> is red. Yeah, yeah, Moon Day Hong. Moon, moon, moon Day one, Hong. One is full. Man Di Hong. Okay. And they'd say that about the nationalist flag as well. The red means sacrifice to the country. See, all I knew as a kid was that we would all go scrambling into that pile of red to find unburnt um, firecrackers. Yep, yep. I did that, so, that too. Very dangerous. <laughs> uh, yeah, but... Uh, that's how you get them for free. Uh, a comment from uh, a question from Alan is uh, he is admires your your cultural knowledge. Uh, is that your background, cultural studies? Uh, you know, is no, that your I'm, profession? I never took a uh, history course. I took one Asian American course when uh, Berkeley uh, had their strike, and I didn't, never had to go to class. This is something I did pretty much on my own because of my interests to be culturally literate. I don't really read Chinese, but I think it's uh, possible to be cultural literate, to understand the culture and to communicate better with fellow Chinese by just reading up on it. It's already eight o'clock. So anyone win the uh, lottery yet? Does the... Uh, Chinese Historical Society of Southern California gets us 10 million. No, but we nope. still have 130 <laughs> people in the audience. And so that's okay. So, uh, yeah, we're over, but if you want to stay, I'm willing to stay. Oh, yeah. No, I, I, I think we can hang in here for a bit more because I, I see a, a couple of uh, questions and comments here, too. Um, Let's see. This is a, a really long one from from Glenn. Grateful Dead, the Grateful Dead, the rock group, developed yes. a dragon for their Chinese New Year shows from 1985 to the 1990s. And I guess you're being in San Francisco, you would know who the Grateful Dead are. Uh, but it was uh, led by Jeff Lim, who is from El Cerrito, and then uh, part of the hog farm in the first head of camp uh win a rainbow uh let me see here the the final part of that comment was the the grateful dead's dragon head was made in hong kong and the dragon's body was added onto it uh, until it got to about 110 people to run the body <laughs> you, is that something you recall <laughs> no i never saw the dragon with the Grateful Dead, but uh, my club was invited to do uh, uh, do the opening act uh, with the Rolling Stone in New York for Easter 1977. But uh, yes, uh, the dragon is used for many props. We also did What's Up Doc, the movie, the dragon scene. So we did a lot of commercials and a lot of these. The dragon is, and line dancing is often used as props for these. Yeah, it's uh, quite powerful. Uh, David, I don't know if you can see this comment from Christopher, uh, but no. I can't read the Chinese word. He has seen a, a figure in Hakka villages in Hong Kong, but uh, also uh, in Australia, where he is, and and welcome Christopher for joining us from the uh, okay <laughs> the other side of the world. Uh, but uh, if we're able to unmute Christopher, can we do that? Maybe you can express your okay. Maybe I can seen. answer another question first yeah. while we try. I'd uh, mute Christopher. Yeah, I think uh, we, we have, I saw an earlier comment here. Uh, Celia Tan is on the call. And she says she would like to say a few words after the Q&A. 
Uh, okay, I maybe we can line her up after Christopher, if you, right. if you folks want to do that. Any other questions for me? If not, I might have one last comment. Yeah, why, why don't you go ahead and- uh, Okay, not included in my talk is uh, my concern about Asian hate that we have today and uh, what's the pushback. Now, I have mentioned microaggression that is the buzzword for Black Lives Matter. And what we know about uh, microaggression, uh, which means things we say unintentionally that might seem harmless, but in the long term could be very psychologically damaging. Like if we say line dance is done to ward off evil spirits, uh, it's sometimes difficult for a young Chinese growing up when the adults are saying this and their friends then ask them, you Chinese really believe in this? What are these evil spirits? How do they, how does this dance ward them off? But adults are saying this. So sometimes it can be harmful. And Dr. Daryl Sue is the person that did the study on this. So if you look him up, S-U-E, Daryl Sue, Columbia University. Learn about this. You have a responsibility to learn about this, to start dealing with Asian hate. The other thing is I hear parents, uh, enlightened parents, politicians, leaders, sometimes preachers, uh, talk to young children that this country is about diversity, is about equality how everybody should be equal and how we must have true integration. But I almost never hear any one of them tell us how. You know, we always say we have to have education to rid ourselves of this Asian hate. But what education? What content? Well, actually, we know how to have true integration, get different groups to work together and feel close, to feel as a community, to feel like brothers. We know that Gordon Allport in 1955 wrote a report for the government about this topic, how to have true integration in the US. So you have to look up Gordon Allport and contact hypothesis. What this hypothesis says is that to have true integration, you must have contact, that's easy. You call a party, you call a meeting, people come together. But you have to have equal status contact. People have to come together feeling equal, academically, politically, status-wise, monetary-wise, socially, they have to feel equal. And lastly, they have to, you have to have equal status contacts towards a common goal, that's pretty hard. People come to the uh meeting with different agendas but we see glimmers of this we see it in our teams our sports teams especially those teams with winning seasons you see joe montana with ronnie lot lot uh and with uh all the mixture of people from different backgrounds they're lifelong friends i see this in performance art in the line dance group it's perfect we say American born and China born don't get along. In the line dance team, they get along very quickly and they're lifelong friends. So we must encourage these types of activities with our young people so that true integration can happen and there's hope for the future. That's my end of my preaching. <laughs> Thank you. Well, you know, th this, this is the kind of message I think we want we all want to share. I think that's one reason why many of us are involved with organizations like the Chinese Historical Society uh, is to really share our 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 common traditions and common origins and common values. So it's it's hard to believe that. Uh, that there are people who don't necessarily who don't quite understand that we have been a part of America, part of this country, uh, and uh, 
one of the the, the great uh, benefits values in, in in that we're projecting hopefully is really uh, uh, there there are more commonalities than differences. We appreciate the differences. We appreciate the uh, the fine uh, the classical traditions that. Uh, Basically, we, we all are trying to achieve the the, the same uh, uh, goals. Um, I don't. Oh, here's a question from. Uh, well, we can't seem to see a, a box for for Celia, so we're not able to unmute or to bring her into the conversation. Um, but uh, let me see. Uh, I'm reading. Something from Grace and Ricky. We had a rally in Ventura, uh, instead concentrating on a negative call rally. We educate public, the public to learn about Asian and All Lives Matter. We all have different backgrounds, professionals. Uh, we spoke about how we can do it. So it's basically a, a message that both you and I and others are really trying to share is that um, a, discrimination is is a thing of the should be a thing of the past, and it really is. We we should be educating ourselves and really be sharing. So, um, Felicia, maybe you can can unmute, or maybe uh, all of you out in the audience, you uh, can unmute yourselves and and uh, feel free to speak up. Uh, what I uh, could do. And by the way, um, if I didn't welcome all of you before, uh, that Susan Dixon did, of course, uh, but I, I do uh, appreciate your, your presence at our meetings. Uh, do feel free to go to our website uh, where we uh, you can send any messages or questions. Uh, we, we do monitor our, our mailbox. So if you have any follow-up questions, please go to chssc.org and um, go to our mailbox. Um, any questions for the good of the order out there? Do we have a, uh, please feel free to speak up, unmute yourself. Well, I, I have a question. This is Bob Lee. Yeah, hi, Bob. Um, I want to find out they say that there weren't parades where the dragons were participating in. What was the what was the purpose of having the dragon come out at that time? Was there a beginning of a certain place? Were they supposed to go to a certain place? What was the ritual behind the dragon coming out? Oh. Uh, with the lions, you know, you you go from store to store, and supposedly you bless each store with uh, prosperity, a good business. But what 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 does the dragon actually do? It's supposed well, tr from way back, back in the Han Dynasty, we know they had variety acts and they had all sorts of animal dances representing different cultures surrounding China. There was the bear culture, the deer culture, the rabbit culture, the dog culture, the snake culture. But the very end was the dragon that came out representing all the culture in Han China. And so it was the most powerful. It put the other animals to shame. And But it's really composite. It's like in the Northwest, we have the totem pole. Basically, that's what it is, is composite of all the tribes. That's what the historians believed. So, but for us here, uh, a dragon dance was done in traditional China sometime to bring the rain, but it's auspicious. It's a auspicious animal that will bring auspiciousness. It's a hope for auspiciousness for the community. And of course, there's different kinds of dragons. For the last 150 years in Hong Kong, in the Daihan district, they would have the, drag, uh, the fire dragon. It's made out of incense. And that was performed to get rid of a plague that was in the Daihan district in Hong Kong. And this evidently worked. And partially it's because everybody cleaned up to welcome the dragon. So you clean up the 
your home and everything because everybody's going go, go to come through your district. And firecrackers are known for a lot of sulfurs. That's one of the main components of firecrackers, and that's a germicide. So if you light a lot of firecrackers like they do in Asia, uh, is you're fumigating the whole area. So in some ways that will work. So it's a uh, uh, many reasons. Now is mainly for entertainment and celebration. It takes a whole organization. It just shows that you have a big organization. You have uh, about a hundred people and you have uh, a lot of money and organization to put this together and to do this parade. And they had this in all the small towns, all the mining towns had their parades to just show the local, uh, your local fellow Americans that how organized and what a rich culture China really is. Well, what did the dragon dancer do in China in villages? Well, there there are many. In fact, uh, China we have more ch dragons in Sichuan than anywhere else. And for the Cantonese, it was really introduced by the Hakka, the Kejia from the north. They introduced a lot of the types of dragons and the symbolism behind the dragons and lion. We just don't give them credit. Uh, so it's still done for different reasons uh, nowadays to bring tourists. In Sichuan, they have this fireworks dragon and you go there near the New Year time and they shoot off so much fireworks, it's dangerous, but it's their way of cleansing that community. But oftentimes in the olden day, if you had a lot of uh, bad things happen to you, like Rock Spring, where Chinese were massacred, you would give special donation to the temple uh, to hope for auspiciousness, a change, and you would bring things in like the dragon or opera troupe to change things. Is a community hope for a better tomorrow. And everybody works towards that. And when they do work like that and have a celebration, the community do come together for a common cause. That's your common goal to get everybody working together. Um, Jean and, and um, David, this is Irene Lamb. And um, that was a really wonderful presentation, David, just really fascinating. And um, I know Celia Tan is listening from, from Shandong, from China, and um, she wanted to, to comment, but she's not able to get in. But, um, you know, they are definitely keeping the lion dancing tradition alive there and teaching the next generation. And I guess that, you know, that brings me to my question, which is, um, what are the efforts of, of, are there any efforts going on now to keep the tradition alive here? Yes, there are many, many line dance groups uh, now around the world. The most number and the best Chinese line dancers are in Malaysia today. Since the 1980s, the best line dancers are in Malaysia, not here in, not in China, not in Taiwan, not in Hong Kong. They win the international competition almost every year. Actually, they win it every year and the best coaches are there. Uh, they introduced this type of acrobatic line dancing on top of posts that are eight to 10 feet off the ground. So it's quite dangerous. I don't like to teach it here because it's too dangerous for the kids. You have to have a lot of insurance and you have to have the parents' permission. But in Malaysia, they just do it. And they have a lot of professional team. So it's very popular now. And some of these teams can make a lot of money just performing for store opening, for marriages, for special occasions. So there is also profitable for the martial arts schools to have a line dance school, uh, line dance team because that's the money making aspect of the martial arts group. When I ran the Zhongai dance troupe, uh, by 1974, we, we never charged membership we never wrote for grants. We were making 40,000 a year on line dancing alone. 
And our decision was either to buy a McDonald franchise so all of us can have summer job every summer because that's what it cost to buy a, a McDonald franchise in 1974 or the whole school goes to Taiwan and Hong Kong and spend six to eight weeks learning the culture and the dances and we don't own a McDonald today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I suppose I'm wondering um, um, about the, I mean, some of the really interesting traditions you talked about in the beginning is, uh, I mean, that's so different from the modern day lion dancing. It, is there a way that you see to preserve that kind of knowledge? Yes, uh, that's why I'm pushing for Corey Chan to publish his on 800 Chan, some meaning of each one of these mazes or puzzles that's put up to challenge the line dance group. And uh, I do have the book that was writ 400 page book on the history of line dance and line dance in the Bay Area mainly. And now I have 13 more chapters. So, uh, but these are on in English. Uh, one day I'll translate it, uh, have someone translate it into Chinese, but uh, we've done enough studies on it and other people are studying it. So I think uh, it is there, but few people read these uh, or really take it to heart or incorporate it into the dance. Most dance schools today want to do the acrobatic style because that is so entertaining and it captures the audience. They don't like to do the ceremonial type because they're slower. And unless you appreciate the symbolism and unless it's done very well, uh, it's not entertaining. So that's yeah. that's the problem. I think it'll survive. If anything, the martial arts and line dancing will survive because the money is in it. The kids like it. It's entertaining and is, uh, is seen in a lot of places. I, I've seen the the entertainment. You can see actually those Malaysian world championships uh, on YouTube. So it, 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 it's worth seeing. But to me, it, it's really much more entertaining or emotional to see a face-off between two lion dance groups on the street. Uh, because then you you begin to see the the drama and uh the yeah. the uh, uh the uh, the desire to to sort of outperform each other so who, who's really the more ferocious and by the way I, I should give a shout out here to vince chan from the immortals and maybe your dad's watching too so uh if jeff chan if you're there hello um, I don't see any more comments. Anyone else uh, have any thoughts or comments? Uh, I do. David, um, yes. it's Grace. I yes. had a question for you. I, I see that, you know, the lion dance and a, and a dragon really celebrate a lot for the Chinese uh, community, like the uh, New York Chinatown or Boston Chinatown or LA Chinatown. But they still teaching those things in those area. Like in Ventura County, like where we live, I, we have a Kung Fu master that teaches the lion dance. But in some of the city, it's like they don't have a lion dance master to teach that skill. However, there's other competition that they, you have like Taekwondo or, you know, all the other similar, like the people think that it's a, um, um, you know, like more like a Kung Fu type of thing. How is it not so attractive to those community for the lion dance, what was the different style of it? There, there's mainly two styles, and they're really they're pretty similar to the Hassan style, which is now used for competition, and the Fasan style, which is more traditional. Uh, it's not hard to start a lion dance school. You don't even have to know lion dancing. You can watch videos nowadays. It takes about three months to teach someone line dancing about as much as you can teach the different techniques the rest is just practice how good they want to be and the kind of messaging you want to do in your performance 
And uh, it's a platform to learn other things, just like martial arts is a platform to learn about discipline, goal setting. Right. That's a real lesson. Uh, that, and then you should get out of martial arts in two, three years. You should, you know, you can be a doctor in six years. Why does it take 10 years to learn a martial arts style? That's really ridiculous. Then you have to look at the teacher, how good the teacher is. Because you can really m learn most of these styles uh, very quickly if you know how to teach. So uh, the main thing is to teach the goal setting, the discipline, uh, the obligation, the reciprocity to teachers, to for them to teach someone else. So it gets passed on. And then they they take the discipline, they learn to apply to be a doctor, a dentist, accountant, whatever else. That's the real lesson of the martial arts and line dancing is teamwork. Uh, it's not an individual sport. You're only as good as the weakest member. If the tail fall down, you fall down. So it's uh, learning teamwork, which is very important for Chinese Americans, for everybody to work as a team. Almost all corporate discoveries today are done by team. No one person can really know that much. So it's very important for young people to do line dance or play sports, to be part of a team, to be a leader of a team, which is basically to serve. You know, the, a leader is the one that's willing to serve the rest. So uh, yeah, I think this is now 825, we're getting to the end. I'm more than happy to talk on other subjects. I talk about Chinese concept and Chinese rituals on death, which is very different from the West. We don't really worship our ancestor. We venerate them, that's totally wrong. And I talk about the uh, hidden meanings on Chinese motif and uh, quite a few other subjects. So invite me back. Yeah. Well, oh, well. Uh, how, how long can you can you hang on for a few more minutes? Uh, sure, David. Yeah. So I, I actually did see a couple of more questions, and maybe we can just uh, respond to those. Can you comment on the difference between Hakka Unicorn Keilong dance and Lion dance? This is yeah, what... that's a Keilong or Qiling. Uh, this really should be just called Qiling because sometimes the uh, the Chinese unicorn has two horns. In fact, most most frequently has two horn more than one horn. Uh, so is the Qiling is the animal that was seen uh, when Confucius was born. So it's a very auspicious animal that's only born uh, when a very important, uh, it's only seen when a very important person is born. And so during the Ming Dynasty, uh, Zheng He, the admiral, he brought back a, a giraffe from uh, Africa and caught a chiling. So the emperor was very happy that a chiling was seen during his reign. That means it was a very benevolent reign. Now the Hakka are the only people uh, that perform this chiling and they perform the centipede and they perform a lot of other animals. Like I said before, it was the Hakka that introduced many of the forms of dragons, uh, many, many forms of dragons and lions to uh, the south. And the Hakka uh, lion is like a box. And I performed it once. Uh, and I, I had a transfer to a Hakka person in my dance group. And is uh, is very difficult to do because you have to be in a stoop position, and the head is held above your head, so it's very difficult to hold that position. But the ha yeah, the haka uh, chiling is what they usually perform for their celebration, and it just means auspiciousness and benevolence for that community because the chiling is a very benevolent animal. You know, I, I have seen the insides of, of a lion head. And of course, there are all sorts of strings to pull. Uh, how, how difficult or how challenging is it to operate all the things, the eyebrows and the ears and the, 
uh, everything else. Well, yeah, those strings is one string that control both the eyes and the ears. You can pull them individually, but normally you pull one string and all of them move. And it's actually pretty easy. Uh, initially, it might be difficult, but underneath the head, if you do it right, your body pushes out against the line head from the inside. So the line head turns with your body. Wherever your body turns, the line head moves. So you're not using your arms to move the line head. So it's very light. It's your body that actually controls the line if you do it properly. So your hands are really free to do whatever. So th that's one of the tricks of line dancing that you use your body to push out on your body so it's pushing against the head. It just just looks complicated because it seems like you have to hold on to something and you have to have all your hands. Not really. Engaged. It's only you use your arms when you lift the lion off your body. But when it's, your, when it's on your body and mm -hmm. you push out with it against the lion, the head would automatically move wherever you point your body. I see. So it's a great design. Uh, what else we got? Uh, I, I think we're really reached the end of the evening. I think we, we've had uh, at least 140 people uh, online at one point or another. So very informative, very educational, uh, and you're very articulate. You remember your, you know your history. So this is really appreciated. Uh, I just wish that we could all be in the same room together so we could just uh, share as a follow-up. Uh, a few of us normally would go running off to have joke at uh, the Phoenix Inn or some other uh, place, late night place, and uh, share even more. Uh, maybe one day we can get together again all afterwards. Uh, and those of you, of course, uh, from out of town, uh, please uh, come down and visit the Chinese Historical Society. We're at 411 Bernard Street in LA Chinatown. We're uh, open to the public on uh, Sunday afternoons. Uh, of course, you can also visit the Chinese American Museum in uh, El Pueblo uh, next to the plaza, next to Alvera Street. Uh, so there's a lot of local history. There's a lot of history in, along the coast, a lot of history in the West. And uh, as I commented earlier, Chinese American history is, is American history. So I thank you all for joining us this evening and uh, we wish you a happy November and uh, wish you all a great Thanksgiving. Thank you. Oh, Gene, can I make yes. an announcement? Oh, sure. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, okay, we. I'm the president of the China Society of Southern California, which is co-hosting the program, and we are probably going to also co-host the um, December program, which is a a dinner get together at the Golden Dragon. But besides that, China Society is going to have a Zoom program on the day before that. Uh, I believe it's. December 7th? 6th. 6th. So it's our, a our dinner is to December 7th. Okay, it's the 6th. Um, and we will be very blessed to be able to get a speaker from Taiwan. And so this will be a Zoom program and it will be on Chinese baby carriers and the art and the uh, of making them uh, and how they have been adapted to uh, modern standards. So it should be a very good program. And I hope uh, all of you will also want to attend that. Uh, we'll be sending out a bulletin uh, soon. And um, I, I think it'll be something that will be very interesting for all of you. Thank you. OK, thanks, Bob. I put the link to the Eventbrite for that event in the chat. For everyone to see. Oh yes, do that, please. And we'll put it on our respective websites too. 
Okay. Well, anything else, Bob? Oh, yeah. <laughs> David, um, the China Society also gives programs. We are, whereas the Historical Society is more, more focused on Chinese in America, we're focused on Chinese culture. And uh, we would really like to have you do a, a talk for us. Um, more than happy to. We can chat later. Okay, fine. Thank you. Okay. Great. Okay, once again, have a great evening. Thank you all for coming. Thank you all for joining us.